a very short but powerful gospel, which we find in all the three synoptic gospels today, is about Jesus going into the desert to be tempted by the devil, a fasting of 40 days and 40 nights in prayer and fasting. Remember that Jesus has just been baptized in the Jordan as an example for us to purify the waters of baptism, to prepare us for our own baptism and the call to be baptized. And now he's in the desert being tempted. And then right after this, he'll go into his public ministry and all the healing and casting out of demons, uh, changing water into wine and all the great miracles of Jesus. Today we might ask a question of why did Jesus go into the desert to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights? An abridged account of Jesus' temptation endured in the Old Testament we see today as he is tempted by Satan among the wild beasts as the first Adam was tempted, the first Eve, among the beasts in paradise. He likewise retraces in this gospel story the step, the, the, the journey of the Israelites that were being led into the wilderness by the Spirit, Spirit and tested for 40 years, marching through the desert in temptation. In the end, Jesus succeeds when Adam and Israel are by resisting the devil and proving his filial love for his people through the Father. This initiates an extended campaign, if you will, of, of, against the demons and helps us to see that what anything that we would endure ourselves in temptation has already been endured by Christ. Jesus, in enduring this temptation, helps us, if you will, to be trained as his disciples, to know that our baptismal call, the grace of our baptism, and the sacramental life overpowers anything in our lives that would tempt us if we allow God's grace into our lives. We then commit ourselves in the same way as Jesus to these 40 days of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. I want to take a look at more particularly this call to fast this day. Of the three, we might claim that it is the least embraced by Catholics throughout the world. Prayer, yes. Almsgiving, acts of charity, yes. But oftentimes fasting can be maybe left out or misunderstood. If we go to the catechism of the Catholic Church and just go right back to the basics and look up fasting, it would tell us, remind us, that fasting is refraining from food and drink as an expression of interior penance, an imitation of the fast of Jesus for 40 days in the desert. Fasting is an ascetical practice recommended in Scripture and the writings of the Church Fathers, and it is sometimes prescribed by a precept of the Church, especially during the liturgical season of Lent. What is this precept that the Catechism that the Church refers to, but one of the five precepts of the Church? The precepts of the Church are set in the context of a moral life bound to and nourished by the liturgical life. Remember that the first precept is to attend Mass each week. Well done. You all have accomplished the first precept of the Catholic Church today because you are here either in person or live streaming with us in the dispensation of these days. The second precept is to receive the Eucharist at least once a year during, um, during the time of Easter. Well, that may seem kind of odd to us because we have the privilege of receiving the Eucharist literally every day of the week in America. Um, throughout the world, that is not the case. There are many parts of the world where the Eucharist is not available to the faithful day in and day out. And so they're encouraged to receive at least once a year during the season. Season of Easter. A third precept of the church is that one would go to confession to receive the sacrament of reconciliation at least once a year and generally um, pre the Easter season. The fifth precept I'm going to pop to and come back to the fourth is that all faithful should contribute to the needs of the Holy Church, that is, through tithing, to be sure that the church can gather as a body of Christ for worship, to be sure that our ministries can continue to bring the good news to the world in which we live and to fortify our own lives and our own souls. 
The fourth precept is the one that's referred to in the definition of fasting today, that you shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church. And this ensures that the times of ascetical uh, discipline and penance, which prepares for the liturgical feasts and help us to acquire mastery over our instincts and freedom of heart and soul. This ascetical penitential practice of fasting then is a call for each of us as Catholics to, like Jesus, empty ourselves of things of the world, empty ourselves of anything that is not of God, and fill up then with God himself. The most simple and basic understanding of fasting is to empty of self in the world and to fill up that space in our lives, our souls, our minds, our hearts with God. How beautiful that we get a chance in this sacred season, pre-Easter every year, to enter more fully into the call to fast. I'm always reminded as we hear this gospel and the call to fasting that when someone is moving closer to God through prayer or fasting or almsgiving or anything in their lives, that many times the devil will not like that. And in fact, he will then show his face to isolate, to divide, even to deceive people. We know that God unites and gathers and provides us truthful living, ways to live truthfully in his light. But the devil wants to isolate, divide, and deceive. And so Jesus in the desert is tempted to just that. Anything that we could have possibly possibly be tempted to in our own lives, the early church fathers say that Jesus was tempted to in his true humanity and true divinity in those 40 days in the desert. And yet, he shows us that with that connectivity with the Father, as he was so connected, as he emptied himself of worldly things and emptied of his own self, and connecting with the Father through fasting and prayer in the desert for those 40 days, that it is possible. And in fact, it is a great gift that we can resist any temptation in our own lives in the light of Jesus' example. Many of you maybe have heard me tell tell the story, but I think it fits so well again today's gospel that I'd like to share it again on a particular mission trip that I had the privilege of leading some years ago with uh, nine of our students on the campus of IUPUI. There we have a house, a formation house named after St. Teresa of Calcutta. At that time, we, the women of the house who were living in formation had this desire, this kind of call to go to Calcutta, to retrace the steps of St. Teresa and to enter into not only um, pilgrimage, but into a mission to serve in the homes of, of Teresa and the missionary sisters there in Calcutta, the home for the dying, the home for the sick, the home for orphan children, even to visit the home for lepers while we were there. In preparation, um, we prepared for several weeks, and each night I would give them something else to kind of be prepared for this great mission that we were headed on. And one night I particularly talked about this gospel of Jesus' temptation in the desert, and that when anything good is getting ready to happen, many times the devil will want to tempt, want to deceive, want to isolate, want to divide those who are entering into that goodness. And so I was just kind of saying, hey, beware, because we're getting ready to do something good with God, for God, and you might get kind of attacked. All the days up to the mission trip, I kind of checked in on them, and each week we would do another catechetical in preparation, and each time they would say, everything's fine, Father, we're doing fine. And then the trip began. And we had a flight into Newark and just a short layover there and flying into D.C. and out of D.C. into uh, on our way to India. And lo and behold, as we have boarded the flights in Newark and are on the uh, tarmac ready to take off to our short puddle jump flight over to D.C., the flight was delayed. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then 20. I'm like, what is going on here? We have a short connection on the other on the other side in D.C., and we need to go. And I'm beginning to pray. And all of a sudden, I look out the window, and I see that there's a truck that is parked behind the plane. And that's keeping us from moving. And I'm like, what is going on here? And so as I look closer, I see someone looking in the window of the truck. 
is to peer in to see if they can find the keys that are locked in the truck, right? And so I'm like, Lord, have mercy. What is going on here? And so I begin to pray a little bit more, and then I see the man being picked up by another truck, and they leave and go somewhere on the other side of the grounds of the, of the airport, probably to, find, to see if they can find another set of keys or some way to break into the truck to get the keys out. Ironically, the truck was the truck that removes the sewage from the bathrooms on the plane. I decided that if I ever were to write a book, the title of the book would be that The Devil Drives a Poop Truck. <laughs> And so there we were, tight schedule, trucks in the way, we can't move, we're praying. Finally, we see the truck come back with a man in it, gets the keys, unlocks it, moves it, and we're on the flight. At this point, I knew it's going to be a very, very, very short window. We would have to literally run through the airport, hoping that they'll keep the doors open for us. Two of the participants have brought another flight because they were coming from another part of the country at that time into D.C., and they're already there, and so we let them know that we're running late, please tell uh, the steward or stewardess if they would leave the doors open, we'll be there. We'll be running. And so we do. We are ready to get off the plane. All the bags we had carried on. However, because of the excessive amount of carry-on bags, they had placed some of our bags underneath and had them checked underneath. And so we knew that that was going to delay us even more. Out of all of the students' bags, and mine, mine was the only one that was above in the overhead bin, and all the rest were underneath. So I realized that this is going to hold us up, and so I say to the women of the house, is there anything in your bags that you can't live without for the next two weeks? Now, can you imagine college students, women saying, what are you asking here, Father? Like my clothes, my makeup, my this. I said, no, like, do you need any medications? Is there any medications we can't live without? No, Father. Would you be willing to live without those things? Don't worry, because most of your clothes were made in India anyway, so you can buy them there. And so they agreed. And I thought that was such an act of faith in that moment to kind of unite again, to bring the grace of God back into this deception that we were facing, this division. And so we got off the plane, and again, we're running through the airport, and I've got the, my bag on my shoulder, and as we're running down through the airport, my bag flew off of my shoulder and hit a little old lady and knocked her down right in the airport. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy again. What is going on here? And so I picked her up, and I asked her, are you okay? And um, I'm explaining that we're, we have a tight flight. And she says, I'm okay, go, go, Father, run. And so I ran to the, to the uh, door, and of course, the door is closed. We all have missed the flight, except for the two who are on their way now to India without us. Division, deception, isolation, yeah, it's the work of the great deceiver. But again, when we turn to God in those times, then God will conquer all that for us. And that's what we did. We began to pray about the two that would arrive and being received by our hosts on the other end, praying for our own safe trip the next day to be able to rejoin them. And as the trip went on and we reunited for this mission, it wouldn't get any easier. It was hot. In fact, they had had a heat wave in May, which is already a hot month for India. The average temperature was 100. 112 to 115 every day. Uh, it was difficult work and in fact emotionally very difficult because of serving in the poorest of the poor and people with, um, with great disabilities and those who um, are suffering and dying. There was lack of water in some cases. And in those moments, we reminded ourselves that this is the desert that God invites us into. Is it comfortable? No, not at all. Is it convenient? Absolutely not. Is it what we would always choose? Probably not. And yet, in the end, we know that when we enter into the desert with our Lord during these days of Lent and any day of our life, when we're a little bit uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable, when we're challenged in our journey of faith, that these are things that are good, very good for the soul and for our eternal life. As we continued our journey, we, could, we realized that God was certainly conquering any of the obstacles that were placed in front of us. And we had a phenomenal, in fact, a life-changing experience together as a people of faith. 
one of the early days of being in Calcutta, we would every day we would take a holy hour. We would take a break for a holy hour in the chapel where Mother Teresa prayed all of her life. And in fact, as we entered in, I was kind of relieved, like, oh, we can just have a little time with the Lord and just take the take uh, a break from the the mission that we were on. And as we sat down there, all of a sudden, this all this noise. There was a train outside that came by about every five minutes. There were people yelling. There was heavy traffic, rickshaws, and people going every different way. And I thought to myself, Lord, have mercy again. How in the world can we connect with you in all of this noise? And then I thought, how do these sisters do this every day, right? Serving the poorest of the poor, coming into this chapel, all this noise, and yet they connect with God. And then I thought about how that's our world in which we live. Each of us have this noise that distracts us every day. We have things that get our attention away from us during prayer. We have all these obstacles that are thrown in front of us. And yet the Lord breaks through all of that if we'll allow him to, if we ask him to. And so Mother Teresa, I was reminded, said that God speaks to the silence of the heart. God speaks to the silence of the heart. I thought, there's no silence here. How could he speak to us? And yet she quieted her her heart so that the Lord could speak to her heart, not to the noise of the world. In these days of the desert that we're invited into, We need to silence our hearts. We need to kind of block out the noise of the world. We need to make sure that we set aside distractions and deceptions and those things that isolate us or that um, tempt us in any way. And we need to turn back to this great truth that the Lord wants to speak there in the desert in these 40 days to our hearts. And when we empty ourselves of the things of the world, empty ourselves of ourselves, that the Lord, we make room for the Lord then to enter in and to speak to us. May these days be filled with that grace. May it be days that we understand that, yes, God wants to draw us closer to himself, but the devil wants to pull us away from our God. And that we are in a bit of a battle, sometimes a great battle, between good and evil. And that the Lord conquers evil to bring the good. And that he will, if we allow him in these days of Lent, speak to us very personally in the silence of our hearts.